to another exciting round table with the International Carnivorous Plant Society. I serve on the board, I'm the education director, and I serve as the community relations person. I am Kenny Coogan. And today we are going to be talking about breeding Saracenia. And uh, before we start, if you look at my shirt, I have a beautiful Saracenia purpurea on my shirt. And if you wanna support the ICPS's education or conservation initiatives, you can go to the link below and purchase this t-shirt, or you can get it on a mug or a uh, tote bag, and that would be a great benefit to us. So we can do more programming and more conservation work. All right, we have a great lineup of experts on the round table, and I am going to have them introduce themselves, and we're gonna go around the world, east to west, so Matt, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, good evening everyone. I'm Matt Soper from Hampshire Carnivorous Plants Limited and I'm based in Southampton, uh, Southern England, UK. Hello, I'm Manny Herrera. I am uh, based out of Florida. I uh, do have a business, but it is not a carnivorous plant business, so I won't bore everyone with the details of my, of my real business. Uh, and I've been growing carnivorous plants, uh, particularly Saracenia, since I was a kid, which uh, every year seems farther and farther back, uh, probably 12 years old, so that's uh, about 30 years. Uh, I, I don't want to sound too humble because I'm not that great, but I'm probably not an expert at breeding Saracenia, though I appreciate the uh, being included with experts or people who do breed. I, I'm more of a cultivator who has happened to breed Saracenia from time to time. My name's Carson Trexler. Uh, I, I do have a carnivorous plant business. It's American Pitcher Plant. And you're, you're looking right at it. Uh, that's, what, that's what this nuclear reactor is behind me. Uh, and um, I am also on the ICPS board. I'm the conservation and research director, so I work with Kenny. Uh, and uh, let's see, I've been doing this since around the year 2000. And the man who started all is here with us today. That's Jeff Dallas. He'll introduce himself in, 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 in due time here. But uh, Jeff, Jeff and I, I guess we, we go way back since I was about maybe three and a half feet tall. So, <laughs> so. I've been doing this since then, but I worked at Jeff's Nursery before starting my own company. Uh, and now I am uh, fully fledged, uh, running my own game. Well, I'm Jerry Addington. Corning Frog's Nursery is my game. And I've been torching Saracenias genetically for about 35 years now. And this, I assume, is going to be my life's work because I'm a little bit long in the tooth to start another obsession. And plants have always been a big deal for me since I was following my grandfather around in his vegetable garden. And I got hooked on cactus and succulents early. I went to lilies, I went to rhododendrons, and now I am camped out in the Saracenias and the carnivorous plant world in general. And with my personality, I kind of need an obsession that I can chew on for a long, long time. And this has been a wonderful one. There are so many opportunities in this genus. There are so many different forms to work with and they're being so compatible without any genetic restrictions or problems on breeding. It's been a wonderful thing for me. All right, Jeff Dallas um, from Eagle Creek, Oregon, um, founder and co-owner of Saracenia Northwest Nursery um, there. Um, kind of got my start as a, as a kid with interest in carnivorous plants, but somewhere along the line in the 90s, as the collection began to grow, um, I wanted to see about possibly selling some plants um, here and there. So the format that I chose was um, here locally at Portland Saturday Market and was a vendor there for 22 years wow. um, selling carnivorous plants. And that's how I met Carson when I think he was eight years old, uh, came and bought some plants from me. I'm at that time. Um, and now um, uh, 
I per, just a little FYI with me and not to, to make you feel better, uh, Manny, I don't know if I could even consider myself an expert on Saracenia breeding. Got a lot of experience with it. Um, uh, our nursery in many ways has really only delved into seriously doing Saracenia breeding probably in the last three to four years. I'd say about four years because um, we had done some uh, light stuff with that before and just more asexual propagation of Saracenia before that. Um, Carson was actually really instrumental in a lot of getting the breeding program going for us there. Uh, one last kudos, I, so I don't stand here and talk forever, but but Jerry, I wanted to say something um, uh, that I remember from when I was a college student in Seattle back in the 1990s. Um, I went and bought several uh, carnivorous plants that I believe were yours at the indoor sun shop in the U district at that particular point in time. And I would say that probably every single Drosera multifida extrema that we have um, in the nursery is progeny of one of those plants that I got from you. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you guys for introducing yourself so i have a couple of questions and then in addition to my questions we have some questions from social media which we will address so first we will start with jeff but i want everyone to answer afterwards since you just mentioned you just kind of got serious into breeding how do you choose the parents what traits are you looking for so uh, I'll give you a hint. The other roundtables we're doing, like breeding Venus flytraps, they mentioned color, size, uh, you know, shape. So that's obviously going to be different for Saracenia. So what, for you personally, do you like, and what are you trying to, you know, exemplify in your breeding program? I think very often there's there's a little laundry list of traits that we're kind of looking for when ones get selected um, for breeding. The first one is is kind of a subjective thing, but it's like it's it's the wow factor. It's like when you walk past a plant and look at it, does that plant catch your attention? Is is this one that really kind of stands out in a crowd for some particular reason when you see it? And because when we have open houses, the nursery people are walking past all the time, and so sometimes that kind of becomes some data for us to um, look at the one that's uh, maybe worth breeding. Then like some of the things you mentioned, size, the the colors, uh, definitely how fast it grows because um, you can have an absolutely gorgeous plant, but if it doesn't grow worth a darn, um, it, it, it doesn't become worth much with that. Um, and then um, sometimes you know, like how effective of a bug catcher it is um, plays into it. I'd say that one's probably way down the list, but but those would be the big ones right there. So it's, I'd say it's, you know, it's it's color, kind of the wow factor, um, you know, how quickly it grows, size. Jerry, what about you? What do you like to, what traits do, are you looking for? Well, I tend to breed in several different directions because I would get bored if I was only breeding for one particular look. I like, there's room for a lot of different looks. But the thing is to keep clear that if you're just mixing genes together, you're going to get out with a very average, generic looking thing. Like some people have been to put all the different species together into one hybrid. That has never interested me because that is abandoning all artistic discretion, it's lumping everything together, and it's not going to be an interesting plan. You have to keep some level of discrimination going in your mind. Um, the species all have a definite look to them, and they're beautiful plants, all of them are mine. They all definitely look like something. And I try to keep that in mind when I'm breeding, too, is get a plant that looks distinctive, beautiful, and has some of the grace of the species. And because if we're planting seeds of species, we're going to get all good plants pretty much. They're all going to be beautiful plants. But hybrids, when you cross these different things together, they have different folding patterns. And you can get some really ugly plants out of hybridizing. I have crossed two beautiful plants together and got nothing but crud out of it pretty much. And I've also, there are crosses that always yield a very high 
yield of very beautiful plants like well, Judas Hino and Days of Light together, you're going to get all beautiful, saleable plants. But sometimes it crosses where you're reaching further. You may get a lot of crap, but you may get a beautiful plant. One beautiful plant out of a hundred crappy things. Yeah. And um, Simone, the plant I named Simone was like that. That's very rare in that kind of cross to get a plant that's really good. You can get a really good one. And working with plants to create really sturdy plants for nurseries. Plants will hold their traps to as much of the year as possible so people can see them blooming in a trap at the same time. And plants that are really punch it out and aren't just looking kind of crappy here, but a trap here, a trap there, a trap there. We want to fill it up, we want a bouquet. And all the different shapes are available and colors. It's all about shape and color for me. Loving it. All right, very good. So Carson, when I think of your plants, I think of dark and black and tall. So Carson, is that what you're going for? No. What, do you, what traits do you look for? Actually, what you're thinking of or probably what everybody thinks of when they, if they were, were to think of my stuff would, <laughs> would be the crosses of other people's that I grow out <laughs> because my own crosses aren't worth anything. <laughs> Whenever people visit, they always notice, oh, I really like that one. I like that one. I like that one. Oh, none of those are my crosses. They're all Danny Powell's or something. Yeah, I, 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 one thing that I've, so to answer the question in two different ways, I suppose a little bit of a tangent first, I have enjoyed sampling other people's work for the past four years uh, by buying or somehow otherwise acquiring vast quantities of, uh, of deliberately uh, hybrid of, of, of seed, of other people's designs growing them out and and seeing just seeing what what they get you know especially what their trends are but also what their accidents are clearly there are some plants that are, are hybrids that they, that they that were very last minute you know like yellow jacket crossed with leah wilkerson it's like well someone yellow jacket is is notorious for being hideous <laughs> but uh my god it, that was that was not a real eye open when i when i found that yellow jacket um they're very regular shaped progeny. So sampling other people's work has been fun. I suppose my own directions are the unorthodox. If I see that there's a trend, I try to avoid it. And so I've avoided myself doing Morii and I've avoided going for color and I've actually gone for texture, the tactility. Um, what I like most about a plant is not necessarily what it feels like, but what it looks like it feels like. And getting that texture to come out in the horticulture in, in artificial breeding um, is hard if you, if you don't you know, try to understand the plants in, in very individual ways, species by species. But I think I'm making some headway with things like Alata, Alabamensis, and Warii, which are fuzzy, um, and Rosia, which is fuzzy. Uh, but really, I am so early on in this work, and that's obvious by how much, I, how many questions I have that, that I could never. I don't think I'm ever going to settle with a direction, uh, but for now, I'm going for texture. That's very cool and unique. What about you, Matt? Um, right. For me, the main three things are size, color, and vigor. Vigor is most important. I've seen a lot of great plants. I've produced a lot of great plants that just hang on. And I'm not interested in that. They have to be distinctive and a very good habit. The habit of flower with the color of leucophila is great. The leucophila habit for me in the UK here, I don't know if it's the same in the States, one or two pictures in the spring, one or two bigger pictures in the York. I'm not, don't like that. I want them to have multi pictures, strong, upright, colorful, distinctive. Um, and something Jerry was saying earlier on, I agree with 100%, you can pick the two best plants and cross them and come up with a load of rubbish. <laughs> Whereas there's one hybrid I've had, which was a Leia Wilkinson cross with a Rita Soper. And Rita Soper, by the way, is a Micheliana cross back with a Luco. 
and I've had some spectacular seedlings from that cross. Um, Rita Soap is known for my mum, and it's not. <laughs> It's got beautiful flowers. It's not the greatest of plants, but when it was crossed with layer, oh, the range we've got from that's just unbelievable. I've got other crosses where I've huge red atropurpures and crossed them with big red lipped leucophilus and had nothing special from it. So it's very, very difficult and it is endless. And I won't live long enough to do everything that I want to do with the plants for sure. Because, um, well, that's part of the fun, I'm sure. I mean, uh, I'm sure the others will all agree. I mean, I've been crossing a lot of Oreophylla. I find that puts a lot of vigor into some of the plants now. Um, Morio's back with Oreos and Oreos with other Michiana back crosses with Luco. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great hobby. I enjoy it I'm, I, I, it's as much now as I did when I started, when I was a youngster. Um, that's it really. Size, color, vigor are the main things for me and habit. I'd, I'd like to point out that your work is entered at the Chelsea Flower Show pretty much every year. So, <laughs> you, yeah. so the images that you post uh, exemplify your, your criteria uh, uh, very clearly. The, the work that you're, uh, the kind of plant that you're after is stately, almost regal in its presentation, um, you know, enough to outclass an Nepenthes. Thank oh, thanks, God. Carson. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It's a good, uh, um, it's a good and a bad thing. We've been, uh, we've exhibited at Chelsea for 20, 21 years now, and their standards are very high. So we have to, to meet those standards to get it, to get, to get a good medal. So it does force, we grow, if you saw how many plants we have just for display, it's nearly a third of the nursery are just display plants and we never use the same plant twice at another flower show. So we grow a lot purely for display. And a lot of those are 25, 30 year old plants, big display plants. So um, it, the flower shows really do keep us on our toes and we're still breeding. The problem, the one problem we do have is that they want to see a large mature plant. So if we had a new plant reaching maturity now, we've got a couple that are really nice. One of them for Alan Hindle. Um, that's not big enough to put on at Chelsea Flower Show because our other big display plants dwarf it. And the judges would say, oh, well, if it was a bit bigger, then you could, you know, put it on as a, as a display plant. So um, as you know, how long they take, I mean, we take roughly for, from seed five, six years, seed to maturity. And um, that's a long time for us over here. And so to get big plants, it just takes years and years. So yeah, that is a, that's a problem for us. Thanks Carson for pointing that out. And yeah. there'll be it's photos. Good on the screen right now so you can see Matt's work. All right, Manny, you're the only one on the panel who lives in Saracenia native range. When you're breeding Saracenia, what are you looking for? Well, everyone, everyone has said something that has struck a nerve in a good way, and, and I'll touch on that. Jeff mentioned the subjectivity, and that I would say is absolutely true. That's the primary thing with me is, uh, I want something that looks good to me. What I what I want, what I would want to see together. And for me, that usually means short, fat squat. And those are the things I go for. Uh, Carson mentioned something uh, that that I very much agree with, and that's the Mori uh thing. And and uh, Kenny, I think I shared with you yesterday the the, the choice term I have for people who only like Mori eyes, Lucos, and Flavas. I won't say it here. But uh, I, I, I'm a bit disdainful of that taste. Uh, they're beautiful, especially when you see a field full of flavas and lucos and morias, but in cultivation, there's just so much more that can be done with these things than big, tall, uh, flamboyant, uh, flamboyantly hooded or lifting. So I, I go for, for a specific look. That is, uh, so that usually entails perps, rosias, uh, which incidentally are the most vigorous for me down here. One of the one of the counterintuitive things is that living here in the southeast, where Saracenia are native, it's also probably the most challenging place to grow them in cultivation. Uh, they're very they're very rot prone or or susceptible to pathogens and diseases down here. Uh, I know I know individuals who grow them. I know one individual, and y'all probably know him. He grows Saracenia in the middle of the Apalachicola National Forest. Uh, and he struggles with uh, rot and 
disease from time to time when he's growing them in a pot. Now they're growing just a few feet away in the ground. Uh, it, it, that's something that maybe someday we'll find out what it is. But y'all in the Pacific Northwest and in uh, England and Europe definitely don't have it as hard as we do in cultivation. And it shows with the plants that you produce. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, Jerry touched on was the, I believe he said this, and I could be wrong, he said about crossing the species onto each other. I generally agree with that, though I have tended to want to cross species that it, it will bring out the, the good qualities of the two respective uh, plants. So uh, a leucophila on another leucophila, if you're trying to get specific traits, that's something that I, I, I have done and would do. Uh, and I, I, I'm loathe to, to ruffle people's feathers, as everyone knows, but uh, I do cross species from two different locations because I find that to be fascinating just to me. But I've heard that this kind of a faux pas and people don't like it. All right. So Jeff, uh, in the comments, he said that. Go ahead, Jeff. You can you can read it out loud. <laughs> oh, it's just just what what uh, Manny was just saying about um, Saracenia being uh, somewhat difficult in their native range because of the pathogens they can get. I've I've just found so often similar experiences with Darlingtonia um, here. Yeah, it's native. Everybody wants one, but they're so much trickier to grow. And there's there's more to that story, but that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought. I can't even think of growing it here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we do have a question. Anyone on the panel can answer it. And it kind of goes with what Manny was saying. Uh, Jacko Trudder says, what is the breeding potential of Saracenia purpurea venosa montana? So anybody can answer that. Oh. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, I've got a photo I could post for you, Kenny, but... Um, there's a tray we have um, in our um, kind of finishing shed right now that was, I believe, uh, Leo, Leo Wilkerson by Perp Montana. There's not a bad plant in that entire tray. And as everybody was kind of alluding to, it's so common with Saracenia to take two really nice plants, particularly if they're both hybrids, and then you get one or two kind of nice plants out of the whole batch of seeds. All the others are extremely ordinary. This is one of the few crosses I've seen that was just almost the entire group was just beautiful um, coming out of it. And I've saw we have a couple other Pert Montana crosses that are going on. So I'm starting to wonder if there's something kind of like Oreophila where, you know, it's you have a geographically isolated plant. But for some reason, it imparts this unusual vigor to stuff. So. All right, there you go. Go ahead, Jerry. Well, I've used Montana quite a bit, and I wish I'd use it a lot more because it makes beautiful hybrids with just about everything that I've crossed it with. I'm getting some really pretty plants out of crossing Beluca Phyla. Um, the shapes of the pictures, and some of them are very strong. Some of them are not so much, but they're all beautiful. And I can cross that plant with uh, Doreen's Colossus, with any of the flowers, any of the things. And they're all pretty much beautiful plants. And I say, I wish I'd done more with them earlier because I wish I had a lot more of them. And now I'm trying to combine the first generation crosses like that with crossing back to Burt Montana in some cases, back to Luca Philo others in other places. And also with the cordii types glucose and the cordii influence plants. There's so much there. And um, the really fancy forms of venosa can give you some of the same color effects as the Montana can. But the Montana, the specific shapes of the pictures, the way it interacts with other plants, is fascinating and really nice. <laughs> Something I... Yeah, I'm going to be uh, perhaps perhaps a bit of a downer on Montana for, for the sole reason that if I were to grow that plant in this grow room, because it's such a, a montane uh, uh, taxon, the thing only really appreciates cool temperatures. All the progeny I have from my from Perp Montana hybrids down here is languish for, for over a year before attaining any size. 
I suppose that that points out another criterion that I aim for. It's something that I can grow, <laughs> um, not just something I can hybridize because hybrid work can take place indoors or outdoors, mostly outdoors, but, um, and not just something that, that grows vigorously outside. But for me, I need something that grows as a seedling really rapidly. Um, and that's, that's foolproof. And Montana for me down here in this, in this, in this heated basement has uh, actually been, it's been frustrating. It hasn't always worked out. Rosia works better. So I guess that's something within the breeding potential of Montana to be wary of. I see yeah, that, uh, Matt and Manny shaking yeah. their heads in agreement, Carson. Yeah, that, that, I would just say it's really interesting what Carson said. That's one plant that I really struggle with over here. Now, to give you an idea, we had minus nine centigrade just before Christmas. So we're quite cold here. It can be the cold stuff again this last week. And I struggle with it. It just hangs on. It doesn't. I haven't even crossed it with anything. I've got a few of them, but they're just so slow. I don't know what I'm doing wrong with them. I've had it under glass. I've had it outside. Um, I've got it in a peat perlite mix. I don't know if anyone can enlighten me on how you're getting to grow well over there. Um, maybe I, I shouldn't be too cold, should I really? It should be fine under my conditions, but no, I just don't do very well with it at all. Have you had different clones or have you all? Have you yeah, all that was my them? question. I've, I've, I've got, do you know what? I've just got two clones and I've got a few, a few of each and they're very poor, very poor. Mm. I, very I, had one, I had one specific clone. I couldn't tell you yeah. much about it because this was years ago and I was able to grow it in South Florida. I live in North Central Florida now, yeah. uh, which is a big deal down here because my winters are significantly colder than they are down there. Mm. And my nights are also cooler. I had one clone that I could grow in South Florida. I eventually sadly lost it to a cutworm that ate through the growth point and the plant didn't survive. Sometimes, a lot of times they will come back. This one did not. Every successive clone that I've gotten since then, uh, living up here yep. in North Central Florida has not done well for me. That being said, I've been able to make crosses with it and as, as, as it's stabbed from the grave before they've died. Mm. And uh, I have crossed it onto Rosia and I have a couple that are looking uh, very well, and they're seemingly uh, gonna gonna do well. Although it's hard to say when they're seedlings. I find that yes. uh, oh, when they're juvenile, are less susceptible to uh, at least down here. They're less susceptible mm. to to issues. Uh, in my growing experience, the Achilles heel of the Saracenia is the woody rhizome. Once they develop mm. the the rhizome, that's when uh, I lose them most. When they're seedlings, I can almost grow them underwater, and they're 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 fine. Mm. Uh, so these are, are, are coming along. I also grow a, a Montana by Venosa. I don't know who made it. Uh, I didn't make it, but, uh, and that does very well here, but Montana by itself, even in my conditions, which I would say are probably, they're not identical to its native or natural conditions because I think the nights might cool off up in the Georgia, yeah. or they definitely cool off up in the Georgia and Carolina mountains. Uh, and their winters are colder, but they're not extremely uh, different. And yours are probably even more suitable for it than mine. So I, I, I have no yeah. explanation. No, uh, Manny, do yours catch very much insect material? Ours are very poor at catching the Montana. Do we, do we, is that the thing that I might be missing out on? Do, do yours plants catch a lot? Uh, yes, my plants yeah. do. We have, we, as they, they are constantly catching bugs down here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the insect situation is like over there. Uh, yeah. But over here, it's it's uh, pretty intense. And mm. we have two seasons uh, of bugs that are the bane of a lot of Saracenia growers, and that's the love bug season. And yeah. they, uh, the Saracenia engorge themselves on love bugs. I don't know what a love, I think it's a type of beetle or fly, I'm not sure. They're two little bugs yeah. that are stuck together. They're, right. they're in perpetual coitus uh, yeah. as they fly. <laughs> Yeah. And, yeah, and they just, they, <laughs> they, well, people, as they, they, they hit your, your windshield and they stain your car and oh. the, the carnivorous plants just eat, eat them and eat them and eat them and eat them and they will rot the pitcher. So uh, we get that twice a year, it's spring and fall. Of course, right? It would be the spring and fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I don't think yeah. that would be an issue for you, though, that the... the uh, if your question was about the prey and, and catching, I don't think that would be an issue for you. No, I don't. No, I, 
I've never noticed that to be a problem with most carnivorous plants. Mm. Now it's just I, I couldn't I can't work out why they're just so poor growing. I, you know, it's a good point someone was saying there about the clones I've got. I've just got two different clones. That's all I've got, and they're poor. I mean, you get that. Could be that. You do get some. Yeah, I've just got poor yeah, growers on there. Yeah. No, the last yeah. one I grew was a was a cross of two uh, Montanas. It was mm -hmm. a Montana uh, number two by a Montana from Dupont. Uh, so we so theoretically it would be a good strong Montana, and I. I, it didn't stick around, but I was able to cross it onto a rosia from Alabama, and uh, oh. those are, are I'm, I'm hopeful for those. Mm -hmm. The plants from DuPont are interesting. A DuPont, uh, for context, is, is a bog in uh, in Jonesy territory in North Carolina, um, and and uh, the plants from there. I understand have been lumped in and variously lumped in and taken out of the group of herbs thought to be Montana, but the the description of Montana is so loose loose in the end that it's kind of hard to understand what what's perp perp and what's perp Montana and then what's this tatnall saying from Georgia's because <laughs> like, in the end that you, you put them together and and you can kind of see patterns in between between the different the different populations but um uh but they also they also have very distinct personalities and, and as i understand it uh at least larry larry melichamp never never thought that the dupont plants were montana but then i don't think he ever accepted the montana taxon so like in the end you could bring it down to taxonomy and and, and ask what is a Montana? <laughs> so, what yeah. is it? And uh, and I think you get you get several different answers. Right. I like that you bring up the tatnals uh, as apart from being some one of my favorites because they do very well and they're very pretty. Uh, there is a there is a, a a similarity between Montana tatnal and the and the perps that grow in central South Carolina, uh, the the Sheely Pond perps, for example. Uh, there, there's like a there's like a similar look where it kind of becomes difficult sometimes to distinguish. You can distinguish them because you've been growing them and you already know. But if you were to see them blindly, you might have a hard time. Right. Uh, I don't know what tantal would be because uh, there's really no other. As far as I know, there are no other locations for Venosa, uh in Georgia. Right other than what's recorded at Tattnall or maybe Evans County. I think I have an Evans County clone, it's nearby. Uh, but but Venosa would, would theoretically come down from the Carolinas into, into most of Georgia and it just does not. You just have those disjunct Montanas and then Tattnall. And there are no Rosias as far as I've known uh, that, that extend into Georgia. So so yeah, some, I, I, I think that's a good question. What are the Tattnalls? That's something that, that somebody should uh, should maybe work on. Oh. All right, so I'm, I'm going to bring the conversation back to breeding, <laughs> but, but we do need to know who the parents are, so that's great. So for those of you who keep track of the parents, uh, Matt Soper and I did a very long webinar over an hour where Matt showcased his greenhouse and his outdoor growing area, and he did such a great job of like step-by-step this is the tool we use to collect the pollen. This is how we transfer it. So we're not going to repeat that here, but I am interested in how do all of you keep records, like literal records? Are you putting tags in the pots? Are you putting tags on the flower stem? Are you keeping a notebook? So uh, maybe uh, Jerry and Jeff, how are you keeping track of the lineage? Who, who starts here? You, you ahead, Jerry. Can, Jerry. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, basically, my records are on the tags and on the tags that I um, make for making the crosses. I generally do not keep records beyond that. Part of it is I make so many crosses. You know, I'm, um, I'm clinically crazy about this. So I make up to 400 crosses a year. Things go very, very quickly for that. And uh, basically, I'm just uh, 
licking my finger in between crosses, going to the next one, <laughs> licking my finger, writing the tag stone. And it's not precise in the sense that, yeah, the bees, could, some, some, I could screw it up. And the bumblebees, fortunately, in the greenhouses do not come around and, um, and second guess me because they're not active yet at the time that I'm actually doing my crosses. And um, that's, pretty, that's pretty much what I've got on that. I, I do it quick and dirty, it's all about <laughs> form and color. And um, people who um, are more careful, if you're trying to keep records of your of the species, if you're trying to keep a very detailed thing, if you're trying to follow university practices, that's very important on the species, not so much on the hybrids, at least for me. Yeah, uh, I'd say pretty similar. Um, the the biggest the biggest tool is definitely keeping the tag on the plant and on the, the flower stock itself. And then there's a little track record going on of each time the flower has been pollinated and the date uh, when that's occurred. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure because I haven't talked to um, uh, Sean, one of our employees, that's probably doing that, but I believe they may have a notebook going uh, with that now. I think Carson, you had that started. And so I think they've kept up with that um happening so that's that's just kind of how the tracking works for it all right matt well, how are you keeping records yeah similar obviously I, I mark the flowers as they're pollinated and we have labels in the pots and i do keep a, a notebook um but um it's i think we call them growing on but I think you call it growing out we grow the seedlings out for at least three years before we start selecting out anything because I find the color washes out of them the older they get. I mean, I've got some fantastic year and a half, two year olds, and then after three or four years, they're not that special. <laughs> so, um, and, and then they still got the tags on them. And then they, I would select the best of the best out to hopefully name them or, or give them a, you know, a select, a select cultivar status. All right, we're gonna talk more about that in just one minute, but first we have a message from Cliff Owens and they say, seems no matter when I pollinate, I still get no mm. seeds. So anyone on the panel can answer mm. that. Is there tips on how to get the pollen to get on that stigma? Sure, Matt, I, go ahead. I, I would like to say, I don't know whether you find the same over there. I find the best time to pollinate my plants in Southampton here is between 12 and one o'clock mm. on a really warm, sunny day. We don't get many of those over here. But when it is warm and sunny, between 12 and 1, we get uh, a good take. And that works very, very well for me. Um, but I would add that the plants out, we grow outside in a bog garden, which also get pollinated by bumblebees. And remember, our bumblebees have never come across these plants before. They fly straight up from there, straight in, and everything gets pollinated so well. And everything's full of seed. But under glass, I always do it between 12 and 1, and I use a spatula. I think I showed you I don't use a brush. A small piece of aluminium wire, and I flatten the end out like a small spoon, and I scrape the pollen out from one umbrella, and I touch it onto the stick and make a big positive touch. So it's actually stuck on there. And also, I find they're more receptive between 12 and 1. They're very sticky, and you can actually see the pollen sticking on it, whereas... If we get a cold day, which we, we do here in April when our, our plants are flowering, the pollen just seems to fall off. So um, that might be a tip for the time of day. Warm, sunny, midday. That's I find the best for me. Try that. Jeff, anything to add? Um, nothing big. I mean, we do use uh, paint brushes still, keep separate brushes for, you know, the particular pollen collecting flower that we're taking it from. And go in there. I don't think we've been as specific. I actually like that uh, tip, Matt, about the time of day because that that may be really big for us. Um, uh, just yeah. because of temperatures in the Pacific Northwest in, in our area, we probably um, get the most flowering um, in late April to early May if it's in a greenhouse, and then actually late May to June if they're outside. Yeah, with the same. That's the same as us. Yeah. 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 Carson, do it's you have to? Trying. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. No, I just said it is worth that between 12 and 1. They mm -hmm. do seem more receptive and the stickers are stickier. And you, you will notice it. And also with the little spatula I use, 
you know if the pollen forms like small um rolls i suppose uh little sausages i i flatten it out with the spoon of the spatula and pick it up like a dust like a spoonful of sugar almost but on a smaller scale and just touch it and force it up onto the stigma and it seems to take very well like that do you take pollen straight off the anthers that way no no i always pick it out of the umbrella once it drops into the umbrella okay i i don't knock it out no i let it fall okay yeah, and okay. then i'll use it yeah i i haven't really been able to uh the problem is where i live the the the, the original motivator to get this set up down here was was compensate for lack of sun and so my plants actually don't bloom until june if they're left outside uh mid-june well, yeah. sometimes i'll have plants you know just, just languishing and and and, and i bloom at odd times in the shade right but down here i can i can force things up uh usually within within a month and or 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 so almost on the dot for lucos and flavas uh, a little bit longer for for the other species but um the problem is because i don't have a real photo period that i don't think the photo period that i can afford to them which is either 18 or 24 hours <laughs> is is very helpful for uh for pollen collection and stigma receptivity and usually mm. you know usually i'll get a pretty full capsule by the end of by by the time that those those uh by the time they ripen you know i'll probably have somewhere around two three hundred seed but honestly that's more than i can deal with mm. i yeah. this is all i have i don't have outdoor yeah. space to grow these and and I have to and I have to raise, you know, sometimes sometimes over two hundred crosses down here. So the fewer the better. But stigma mm. receptivity, that's still something I'm working out on on how to on how to master down in this basement. As I understand it, naturally, they're supposed to only be receptive for a single day. Um, mm. But in culture, this might be this might be modified, or we might be able to push the boundaries of that receptivity with our artificial means. That, that's interesting you say that, Carson, because I, I, I did miss out a bit. I do pollinate for three days. So I'll do it three days in a row. I didn't know, I didn't realize that, but I'll always do it for three days because I've just found years ago, I wasn't getting very good, uh, you know, very, 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 very seed, my seed rate was very low. Now we're getting full capsules, three days and midday pollination for three I, I, days. I do, I do I do I do four days in a row, uh, right. twice a day, and it's exhausting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. I, I do one day, if if I may. I do one. I, let me just say, it's not not to uh, not to say that what Carson's saying is incorrect, but it's hard to believe that they're only receptive for one day. The amount of open pollination that I get, uh, mm. just bags and bags and bags full of. Saracenia. It's hard to believe that it would only be uh, there would only be one day of rest. Of rest I, I I don't fully believe that either, uh, but but that that little that little nugget is from is from Larry, who whose word I I, I try to shelve and test before I disregard. But so Absolutely. far, I agree with you, Manny. Sure. I don't think that it's one day, at least not practically. I was always I was always taught uh, by different growers that, uh, and this applies to Nepenthes too, for whatever reason, that, that the best times to uh, pollinate are in the morning and in the evening. I never understood, other than the obvious, maybe that there's uh, so the pollen seems stickier sometimes in the morning and in the evening than it does in the middle of the day. Uh, but but that holds that that thought holds true for for Nepenthes as well. Uh, I, I gotta say, I'm, I'm relieved to hear what Jerry said earlier because, uh, I, I, I'm, as far as technique, that's what I do. I finger the flowers and, <laughs> and I'm not, and I, and I don't, I don't lick my fingers. I, I spit on, I spit on them to, to remove the pollen from the previous plant. Uh, I, <laughs> 
So it's good to know that I'm in good company. And that could be because Jerry and I are from the same generation. I've been called a boomer, I've been called a boomer once or twice. <laughs> Certainly in like but, company. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I just go and I, I, I uh, finger the flowers. I take the pollen from the one that I want. It's usually from the umbrella. And I put it on the other. Uh, I've been meaning to, to bag the flowers, but don't get around to it. And generally, the offspring is what I what I plan. I will say it's, it's uh, generally what I planned. I you do get open pollination, especially here where I grow them outside, and there are tons of bees and wasps, prim primarily wasps. And then at night, uh, moths uh, are in the flowers, so that's inevitable. So if you want to do it, if you want to be in complete control of the situation here. You've got to bag the flowers, but I just do that, yeah. and then I, I label the flower stock with a label, and uh, whatever looks like the plant that I intended, that's what I keep. Anything else is uh, considered. <laughs> yeah. Jerry, to finish Cliff's uh, question, do you uh, have to pollinate all four stigmas? Yeah, I do. Five, I think. Do you, do you oh. think if you only touch oh. one or two, do you get zero seed? Do you get half the amount of seed? I just go through the whole thing at once. One, just spot, 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 all the way around it. But oh. temperature is going to make a big difference, I think, in yeah. how long the flower is going to be fertile, how long it's going to be receptive. At high temperatures, I think we go through the cycle so much faster that I'm just running and running, running, trying to keep up with it when it's really hot. And I do know that certain species and hybrids won't drop their pollen unless it's warm enough for them to drop their pollen. And that can be a problem with some of the plants. And with the climate that we have, which is generally cool during pollination season, but there's always plenty. Um, if some things don't work out, others will. Everything gets tagged, and um, it's just like Christmas again when I, collect, when I collect the seed because I've done so many, I've forgotten what I've done. And I say, wow, look at this. It's Christmas, and it's Christmas again when I plant the seed. And every time I, oh, every time I touch it, just about as Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I got... <laughs> All right, I think this will probably be the final question because it's going to be very in depth. My last question is this is also personal. How and when do you select which ones to keep and which ones to cull? So basically, you're looking at 100 seedlings from one cross. What I understand we're looking for vigor and color, but like, how do you say, oh, this one is, has an edge on its sibling? Jerry, this for you, how do you damn, do that? This is the hardest damn thing to do. Make the judgments on the plants. Because you're not going to see everything that the mature plant is going to have when it's young. You don't, on the ones that are, have complex uh, genetic history, the folding of the plants that you can see, you're not going to see that. Make sure you're clear, you're clean on the picture shape until they get bigger. The reds show up quickly, whites show up more slowly uh, as they develop from seed. And it's really hard. I try to keep as many as I can for as long as I can. And now I'm under a tsunami of seedlings to try to evaluate. Um, I say uh, each time I transplant, I try to evaluate and get rid of half the plants. On each it's a good number to keep in mind, Jeff. What about you? For us, um, yeah, boy, I got to agree with Jerry. <laughs> it is tough. This is kind of what we're doing right now, knowing that so many of them are just going to be so-so um, in there, is we keep a little packet of, of uh, blue plant tags uh, present in the greenhouses where new hybrids um, are coming up. And then myself, Jacob, or the employees, anytime as one is beginning to mature, if, if that one keeps catching your attention, because again, we're always thinking, is this something people are going to like that we can sell for sure? Then that one gets a blue tag in it. And then when those plants get bigger, you know, knowing how they tend to change, um, then we kind of reevaluate that again and, and kind of go through this process with, with everybody. It's sort of a vote. Is this worth keeping or not? 
Um, and um, so we, we just kind of keep going through that process until um, the cream rises to the top. And then we've got a few plants that we think are um, some really good ones. Um, one little quick pitch I wanted to make though, because this has been touched on just a little bit with some other folks too. You know, we're doing all these um, intentional crosses, but boy, sometimes Mother Nature just has other ideas going on with stuff. And some of our most remarkable plants have been some open pollinated stuff. Um, and I remember having this really funny conversation with John Brittnacher many years ago, where he's in Southern Oregon in the town of Ashland and climate's a bit different down there than it is up North in the Willamette Valley. And he was talking about how, you know, the, um, the bees down in that area don't ever seem to go to the Saracenia flowers. And we had just produced a video showing both honeybees and bumblebees pollinating, um, Saracenia flowers, um, up in our area and why they choose what they do. And they don't seem to care about flower color or any of those other things, but Long story short, we've just gotten some remarkable plants out of open pollinated um, uh, plants. So, Does it yeah. matter if you are going to name or register a plant that you have no idea the lineage? I mean, you would know the mother, probably. Right, what, what seed it came from. It, it's, it's troublesome. I wish I knew exactly what it came from. I mean, one of our uh, poster children plants for this is one you can find on our website um, periodically because it's a good divider is um, uh, Margaret Anger Lorax. Um, and it's, it's a big um, cross excellence of some kind. It was a random seedling I found in a Venus flytrap pot. Um, and the thing is just a monster. It has incredible colors in it. Yeah, so yeah. it's... But we, we, we haven't registered any of those as of yet. We've been contemplating it, though. All right. Thank you. I really like that practical knowledge of just putting a blue tag in. Like, that's what the listeners want to know. Like, oh, if you have a couple of friends and they keep coming over and they're, like, voting with, like, tokens or blue tags, <laughs> you have one that has, you know, 10 blue tags or, you know, you keep getting the same comment. You're like, oh, OK, I'm going to keep that one versus the other sibling. What about you, Carson? How are you choosing your winners? Uh, so I try to go for whatever the point of the cross was, and I narrowed down whatever seedlings I have. I don't, I don't have time or space to grow anything out to um, maturity. Usually I get up to about 18 inches in a year, but not, not flowering size quite from, from germination. So I can get to sub-adulthood and at about that point uh there's there's two directions i can go with a cross i can narrow it down to the best ceiling that i want to keep or i can i can judge the cross and the quality of the cross for either my you know as far as sales go or as far as you know how how how, how well does it fit my marketing scheme um you know the customers that all like it or, uh, or am I going after a particular look? When, it, when it's a particular look uh, for, a, for an individual plant, when I'm looking for one plant, one keeper plant and across, I, I compare and contrast what exclusive traits I might be able to get from only this cross, something that wouldn't have, wouldn't be replica, repl replicable in another cross. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I gradually narrow it down, narrow it down till, you know, I have uh, invariably, I come up with, with, with probably the, I'm, I'm pretty good at this point at picking out the best seedling in the batch, uh, at least as far as my opinion goes, but when it comes to, because there's another, there's another way to evaluate your work and that's by, well, was this a good cross on, on a whole? Um, and, you know, there, there's certainly some crosses like Jerry mentioned, Simone, where most of them are a bit dross and then you get that one standout plant. Then there are some other crosses where, uh, like, like Jeff said, anything with, with that Montana clone of yours, with Leah Wilkerson just made everything just, you know, uh, jaw dropping good. Um, you know, the result of that critical assessment is what breeder plant was really good for a lot of high quality progeny. Um, and then you 
decide whether you know what kind of crosses you want to do with that plant thereafter. So there's several ways your logic can be directed to different ends. So in Matt's video for ICPS, which I'll have the link in the description below, he mentioned that he usually grows the seedlings out for maybe three or four years before he really has a definitive, like, I'm going to keep this one. And then Carson, because of your setup, you're kind of waiting to maybe 18 inches, you know, kind of like close to mature size. So uh, Jerry, what age are you saying, all right, I'm, I'm done selecting from all of these uh, siblings? I'm never quite done, I think. <laughs> Um, we're all fishing in the gene pool, and um, you need to have the thought process of where you're going. But it's the journey that you're you're getting things all the time that aren't necessarily what you expected, exactly, but can be really wonderful things. Um, sometimes a plant is just gorgeous when it's young. And as it gets older, it's going to have trouble with the different genetics controlling the folding pattern of the traps and so on. You say, well, you know, this is a wonderful plant in so many respects, but it can't keep its act together now. And so you're never really done with the process because there's new things coming up all the time to compare against your older work. Um, it's kind of, it's, if I thought, I figured out everything that I can about this. There's, I can't go any further with this. I've done everything I could possibly. That'd be the end of it. Mm. There's always more. There's always more going forward, right? There's always more going forward. There has to be more going forward. Mm. And I think we've, we're nowhere close to exhausting the possibilities. So what, what about you, Jeff? We'll go back to you. You're looking at all the seedlings. Mm -hmm. And I'm. Do you allow them to go dormant? Are you pushing them through grow lights? Like what? What age or what size are you saying? All right, two, I got two, something. Yeah, two years under lights. Um. Uh. So a continuous grow cycle, keeping them in that kind of fourteen to sixteen hour day range, because uh, it seems to be a, around that point where they start getting grumpy and wanting a dormancy period. Um, and so we're looking, I think, for a certain size to kind of come onto the plant to get an idea of what it maybe is going to look like. But it's within that stage when they're still kind of in the grow room like that under the lights, um, we're starting to tag them with the blue tags and and select for those. Uh, but it's they're definitely they don't make the cut then. It's it's later, especially once they go outside, because um, I'm sure as many people can attest when you've had stuff under lights, once it hits full sun, Sometimes the plant just transforms into something entirely different. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Yes, that, that's so true. Uh, what you yeah. just said, uh, Jeff, and not only from artificial light to sunlight, but when stuff comes from your climate to mine, yeah, <laughs> it takes on a whole other look. It's happened more than once, or from or from uh, any other place that's that's uh, significantly different. Uh, Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm curious about the marketability of these plants. So you have a hundred seeds. We mm -hmm. get one out of a hundred that looks nice. And then you wait three years. Do you start showing the public, hey, look what I have. And then you have one plant and then you have to go back to rhizome division or tissue culture. And then people yeah. are, forget about it because you need, you know, another year or two to, propagate enough or at age three are you like i'm going to start propagating this because the public's going to like it or are you revealing it to the public or you know what stage are you so matt what about you how i, I mean i know you're going to this huge flower show um yeah. and you just kind of talk about your thinking of like maybe like registering or really choosing the select to to register them uh uh plant that you select out I suppose it's got to be at least three years um, if it's going to be named and used by say one of the big Dutch companies which you've supplied in the past then they would want to get it covered by plant breeders rights in which case you can't divide up or give anyone any plant material so mm -hmm. it's to be because otherwise they could end up with legal problems as you can imagine 
further down the line saying that it's from me and no, it's from them. And yeah. so um, we have to keep it completely hidden in the house and then it's then it will be put in tissue culture and mass produced. But not many go that way. Any of, any of my own plants, then when I get something I think is good enough, then I necessarily go through dividing up. But I'm just growing them the old fashioned way, I suppose. I haven't got them under grow lights or under uh, in a grow room. We just three years naturally in a unheated greenhouse. I do a bit what Jeff does. We have blue tags as well, funnily enough. So <laughs> I put a blue tag in the better ones. And then what Jerry was saying as well, I'll try and keep hold of them as long as possible because the traits and the colours do change between year three and year four, I think is when you can really see some big changes. I've seen so many that people have brought round to me and say, oh, look at this, it's two years old, it's absolutely fantastic. And when you grow it on or, or grow it out, it just washes out or habit changes. So I do like to try and keep them three, four years, even five if I can, before I can make my mind up whether it's it's a goodie, a goodie or not, yeah. Hey, I would like to mention something. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, um, there's no need, there's no reason to use anything other than LED lights. Everybody should be aware that LED lights now are the way to go. Even the T5s are not really good compared to the LEDs. This is revolutionary. You can do so much with LED lights. You can see if you got the good lights, if they're close enough, the light is strong enough, you can see the colors in plants six, eight inches high that will be very similar to what you're going to get in the greenhouse later. So that right. makes it easier to see things earlier if you're using the very strong LED lights. Yeah, yeah I should start using them for sure. We definitely got to start using them. It, it's, well, the only reason we haven't is we've had the room and haven't, haven't needed to in the past, but I really should. I can see what you're saying, Jerry. If you can see the color that much yeah. sooner, it, it, it cuts um, years I, off, doesn't it? <laughs> I prefer the lights that have more of a normal color. Sure. Purple lights may be more efficient, may have a higher par level, but I can't see yeah. what they really look like under the so. <laughs> Let's yeah. go to Carson in the purple room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so Car Carson, can you talk about um, at size 18 inches? You're like, wow, this is a keeper. Are you well, sure? Are you showing the public or do you start pre multiplying well, it? I, I'm showing the public right now, I guess. <laughs> so, so this is this is the first this is the first cull stage. There's several cull stages. Remember, I'm doing this uh, uh, to sell things, not to keep them or evaluate them. And I really have to hold back from keeping things because the small area where I can grow plants outside is is stacked now. <laughs> I, 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 I'm I'm throwing things out. I I have I, I've kept I've hoarded too many plants. So so I, I have to be very very uh, uh, very prohibitive. Um, so first things first is at this stage. Here's a whole ton of uh, seedlings that usually I have a little time stamp in here as to when they were sown and and germinated or whatever the last task was. Um, at this stage, when, when the leaves touch each other, I'll, I'll split them up and then I'll pot them into uh, about two inch containers. I don't know how many centimeters that is, Matt. You're gonna have to help me there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. And, and what, I, what I get out of that is I keep I see that that's roughly 36 plants on average per square pot over here of the, of the seedlings. And then I, then I narrow that down to about 20. Uh, I, I get rid of anything that, that isn't growing at, you know, at, at an acceptable rate. Like for example, for example, I don't know, you could, anything like that, 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 that's, that's not even a plant to me, that's trash. And so that's the first cull. And then, as far as the ornamental cull goes, I mean, man, I, I you're <laughs> LEDs really, really do flush out uh, indicative coloration very early on. Um, the legitimacy and honesty of that coloration uh, per environment where they will be grown outside is is variable. 
if these plants were grown outside in California, they'd look different at the same latitude in, in Georgia. If these plants were grown outside in, in Oregon, they'd look different in Washington, they look different in Hawaii, they look different in Japan, you know. Um, they'd certainly probably look their best in the wild in, in, in the American South, but here I like to imagine we come kind of close uh, because none of these colors are lying, first of all. All these plants are variable. Uh, and, and second of all, these, these shapes are pretty unique per, per cross, pretty unique per plant. Uh, uh, so I mean, it's regardless, it's artificial. In the end, do I decide what, to, what would be a cultivar based off of what I see down here? Certainly not. Um, I, I, I'd never, I'd never uh, 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 Post, uh, or, or posit that these are indicative of, of, of what you're going to end up growing out. Uh, you know, sometimes they grow at different rates down here. Sometimes they grow, you know, sometimes the very rate of growth uh, affects the, the, the saturation of color and say nothing of my lights. And also say something of these lights. I have, I have uh, usually the back is red and the, and the, fore, the forefront is blue white so that I can see things. Um, uh, God, did I answer all, all, all your questions? <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Carson. I've got a question. I've got a question for Carson. Carson, did you say one year you can get them up to 18 inches tall, was it? This is, let me, let me find you a good one. I yeah. uh, sold most of the big ones. These, these here are less than a year old. Wow, yeah. No. Uh, now you have to fertilize a lot, so that's every two yeah. weeks. You go in there and you fertilize, and then if the temperature gets too warm, if it gets above 82 degrees, you get a fungal and, and bacterial bloom, mm. and the plants can't cope with that. And then uh, you have to fi sand things, and <laughs> there's mm. a lot of work that goes into this. Um, yeah. But but the result is a semi mature plant in less than a year. Fantastic. Yeah. That that's well. well. I'd like to say we also, uh, that was the first time we've witnessed a carnivorous plant execution live. <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> I have <laughs> gasped across the world. <laughs> I'll say the same thing that I said to the Venus flytrap uh, group. It's easier to call a pitcher plant than it is to do show chickens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've all read about it. I remember, I think uh, Don Chanel wrote about it. Mm -hmm. And people would talk about it privately. Like, could you believe him saying to throw away all those plants? Uh, <clears throat> but we got to witness uh, an example of that. Yeah. Same <laughs> with if I go to a lot of um, gardening talks, like master gardening talks, and when they do the example of how to take a cutting and they're just hacking up a plant, the audience audibly gasps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Manny, we do have another message, and this is from Dish for Life. They want to know, what's the furthest we've been able to push inbreeding without seeing serious depression? So, Manny, do plants show an inbreeding problem? I'm a little offended that the question is directed at me. Uh, <laughs> North, North Central uh, Florida. <laughs> oh, no uh, comment. <laughs> um, but, but it is a fair question, a fair question, a good one. Uh, I, I don't know that I can tell you how far because I have not done, I haven't experimented that with that uh, on the plant. But I will say that it does, it does show up. The, the effects of, <clears throat> of back crossing uh, are evident fairly quickly. How far back you can push it or how far deep, I guess, I don't know. But uh, it was always a general rule of thumb with, with people that you didn't want to, uh, you didn't want to go too far back with, with the inbreeding. Jerry, do you have any insight into, I think you mentioned it earlier that there wasn't that big of a deal. Wasn't that big a deal on what? Inbreeding. You know, like well, keep... you know, I do a lot of back crosses. I do a lot of sibling crosses. I do a lot of selfie. Looking to accentuate certain characteristics, I say, hmm, 
I have a red blue coat that I got from California carnivores a zillion years ago. Thank you. And I have I have selfed it and I got one plant that had better color. I have selfed that again and I had several plants. Now you're going to see a gradual fall off in vigor, but not every plant is going to show that. So you can do this if you're doing big numbers and you can still get strong plants out of it. I have no idea how far you can go and still do that, but um, selfie and back crossing so on, it's a very good way to concentrate certain characteristics. And um, there's no real substitute for doing that. And then you have to work with that. If you get weak plants, you've got to breed back out again and so on. It's just one of the things you just have to keep working. Hmm. Yeah. You know, oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. Uh, we're, uh, I, yeah. I guess I'll go. I, I, as line breeding, uh, as has been done in, in agristology uh, for, for grains and, and corn and et cetera, has also been done in Saracenia in one really notable uh, case by Mike Wang. It's a shame he's not here um, because what Mike did is he acquired uh, uh, Flava Var Ornata from, uh, from Bullock County, Georgia. And they're a very, very, very small population of, of very or, rather ornate plants. I think the originals were rather ornate. But then by line breeding them, he calls every generation the next improved generation. He has mm -hmm. concentrated, uh, as, you, as, you, as you alluded to, he has concentrated these traits uh, to such that they look like Art Deco masterpieces. And they're pinstripe, black and yellow very stately, very short, um, almost dwarf plants that, that have no equal. I think Mike has been one of the, one of the few people with, uh, uh, well, with the actual, the capital to do that. Cause I mean, those, those uh, Bullock County Flavas were, you know, they're, they're limited release, so to speak. Um, so he's been able to cross certain uh, rescues from a doom population over and over and over again with each other, focusing on a very narrow set of traits, i.e. defined black lines, heavy, heavy venation through the tube, and he has succeeded. And I want to pick his brain on that. Very good. All right, Matt and Jeff, do you have any thoughts about yeah. inbreeding or line breeding? Yeah, first I'd say I'll, initially a few years ago I'd agreed with Manny that it just didn't seem the right thing to do. And also that I was told that you get poor offspring and, you know, <laughs> poor plants. But <laughs> in recent years I've been selfing and you get some uh, really strong, um, strong plants. It, they're really good. Uh, and you can just keep, keep on going. And one particular plant is a pubescent form of leucophila from Perdido, Alabama, I've got. And when you self that, they come up fantastic, strong, pubescent, and even some of the multi crown is probably one of my best lucos. It's got a habit almost, almost of a flower where you get multi crowns on a short rhizome, which is a, a good thing for me over here for sure. And obviously, then we're crossing that back with some of the shorter plants to make some pretty pubescent Micheliana type crosses. But um, yeah, I think selfing is not a problem. I don't know how far back you can go before you start getting problems because. I haven't had that yet myself here. So yeah, you can. We've only done a small amount of that. So I don't know if I have a whole lot to contribute to a conversation on that. All right. So we're kind of out of time. I'm going to just do one last question. It could be another hour on itself, but hopefully we can get a short, concise answer. It's from Glenn Carson. Based on genealogy, wild and greenhouse observations, DNA sequencing, and physiological differences, what is the latest, most precise species list for Saracenia with the correct naming? So um, maybe we'll ask Carson because he's on the board for conservation and 
knowing the name of a plant kind of goes with conservation. So Carson, can you list one or two sources or sites that would have a kind of comprehensive list of all of the different species and maybe subspecies and varieties? Uh, yes, I can, I can name two uh, 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 very well respected authorities. First is Don Schnell. Uh, Schnell. Schnell is probably one of the most enthusiastic uh, 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 Saraceniologists ever to live. Uh, went from site to site for, for decades um, doing orthodox and unorthodox things with, with the plants, growing them, and, uh, and sometimes, sometimes even transplanting them <laughs> uh, and testing out the limits of their of their um, uh, of their genetic plasticity uh, as, as far as he could as far as he as far as knowledge went uh, when he was around he was he was he was one of the experts um, but so his, are, his, yeah I was gonna say you're referring to a book uh, well I'm referring to his whole corpus because he never compiled anything um, he just published a lot in Castania and Rodora, which are journals from the American South. He recognized critically uh, the, sub, sub, the, sub, the varieties of Flava um, and the rubra complex. So if you see a whole ton of rubra subspecies, that's his work. Um, and if you see varieties of Flavas, except for Regelii and and I believe Atropurpurea, most of those are his, his designations. So he was seminal in, in, in noticing the differences between those plants. Um, but the, the botanists, professional botanists who've worked on Saracenia were Larry Mellichamp and Frederick Case and uh, Rob Noxy. Um, uh, and they worked, they worked on those plants from 1970 in 1954 through uh, the early 2000s, 2005, and they have a different view um, that there are about 11, 12 species, and uh, the most critical, uh, critically different uh, plants between uh, differences between him and between Melichamp, Case, and uh, and Noxie and and and, and Schnell is uh, Melichamp, Case, and Noxy recognize Saracenia rosea, Saracenia albumensis, subspecies albumensis, and Saracenia albumensis subspecies warii, uh, and uh, I believe everybody recognizes Gulfensis, Saracenia rubric Gulfensis as a, as a valid subspecies, um, and not as, of course it's valid, but as a, as a as an undeniable subspecies of rubra. Um, the Viatorum plant, there's less botanic consensus on that, um, mostly because most of these workers retired or passed away by the time that was published by Barry. Um, but if you want to add rubra Viatorum into the mix, egg, it is not my place to say how many taxa there are. I've only studied a few of them, uh, but but I'd say taxa, not just, and not including varieties, but including subspecies and species, you have probably around 15, 16 distinct entities out there. Uh, I'm not going to name list them all because I might risk missing one. But those but, are good uh, scientist names, authors yeah. to look up. And, and critically, the flora of North America was published as an e-flora online in 2008. And that's the, that's the compendium that Case and Melichamp published, uh, published their work in. Um, and under Saraceniaceae, it's volume eight of the flora. You could just go online, look up the flora of North America, Saracenias, and you'll see their, their designations. Um, and that's that's a pretty solidly regarded uh, 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 taxonomy. The difference between the two practically is Schnell's was adopted by the Forest Service sometime in the in the 90s or so, 
Um, but the conservationists, at least in Georgia and North Carolina, using NatureServe tend to use Case and Melichamp's work. So there's a bit of a, you, you can pick and choose. That's right. <laughs> All right. So thank you for that, Carson. And unfortunately, we're out of time because that could be an entire own roundtable or discussion. But I do want to thank the uh, the panel for sharing your growing tips on Saracenia. And I encourage all the listeners to go to our website, carnivorousplants.org, to learn more. And once again, thank you, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. The International Bye. Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.